Okay. Second try, because the first one didn't save. All right. Here we're going to be talking about diseases of the blood and lymphatic system. Um, generally speaking, the, um, the, your body tries to keep blood pretty sterile. There should be no natural flora for your cardiovascular system. If anything gets in there, it's usually killed very fast. Uh, we're going to start off talking about one of my favorite diseases, uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis. Um, I like it. It's interesting, and it has... Um, it's often overlooked. <laughs> so subacute uh, means that it is, um, first off, like acute diseases are usually severe and fast. Like they get in, they produce symptoms, and then you either fight them off and they're not there anymore or um, they kill you. But it's going to be over quick. Um, whereas chronic diseases are basically around forever. Uh, Subacute usually are kind of intermediate. They can persist for months, potentially years. Um, and their symptoms are usually, I want to say mild, although that's not entirely correct. Um, less noticeable. Now, this is bacterial, obviously, and endocarditis. So what endocarditis means is that it's going to cause inflammation of the endocardium, which is the inner layer of the heart. The heart has three layers. It's surrounded by the pericardium, which is a sac that basically keeps the heart all in one place and stops it from bouncing around. The sac is also filled with this lubricating fluid so that the heart can expand and contract without doing frictional damage based on rubbing up against things. And the, the inner lining of, the, uh, uh, of that pericardial sac is the epicardium which is like the outside layer of the heart. Uh, underneath that outside layer is the myocardium, which is the muscular portion of the heart. And then inside that is the endocardium, which is contiguous with the blood vessels um, endothelial lining, uh, with the heart valves. So, uh, the symptoms of bacterial endocarditis are, um, first off, you'll often have like a low grade persistent fever. Um, it's going to be the sort of fever where it's like you might not even technically have a fever. Um, just like an elevated temperature that might be kind of like on the border of what would be called a fever. Um, and it marked an increasing fatigue. Usually it's going to start off, you're basically like not going to notice anything. And you get like more and more and more tired as time goes on. It never really reaches severe fatigue, um, but it can get kind of like moderate, medium fatigue, usually starts off slight. And then um, in some cases, boom, stroke. Sudden and occasionally fatal. So uh, the causative agent here is uh, mostly either staph epidermidis or strep viridians. Interestingly, 
Neither of these are very virulent bacteria. Like, I mean, Staph aureus is virulent, and Strep pyogenes is virulent, and both of those have appeared many times on this list of, of, uh, uh, as causative organisms. But, uh, the Staph epidermidis does not cause very many diseases. Uh, and same with Strep viridians. They're, they're both very, very non-virulent bacteria. And, and this actually makes sense, because if you had an infection of, like, Strep pyogenes in the heart, which can happen, causes rheumatic fever, um, your body would respond very quickly. Like, it would mobilize all of its forces to go kill that thing off, and then, like, one way or another, it's going to be over fast. You're either going to be dead, or it's going to be dead. But either way, your body's not keeping it around. Because they're highly pyogenic. Um, on the other hand, because epidermidis and viridians are not very pyogenic, not very virulent, your body is kind of a little bit more willing to tolerate them. Um, they're also very abundant, right? So, like, I mean, yeah, a bunch of people in the population are going to have some Staph aureus, probably in their nares. A lot of people are going to have some Strep pyogenes, maybe, somewhere. But you've got st Staph ep epidermidis all over your skin, like everywhere over your skin. You've got Strep viridians yeah, all over your oral cavity. So there's just a lot of bacteria there that can potentially infect you. Um, in the pathogenesis, uh, here's basically what happens. So, uh, first off, the bacteria has to get into your blood somehow. And there's two main ways that it gets into your blood. Staph epidermidis is usually going to get in through either a open wound, because it's all over your skin, so it's going to be close to whatever wound you have. Um, or through the parenteral route. Um, you know, you poke a needle into your body and it carries some bacteria with it into an artery or a vein. With strep viridians, um, this bacteria is not found on the skin. It's very commonly found in the mouth. Uh, and it is most frequently associated with dental procedures... Just a moment here. Uh, it's most frequently associated with uh, dental procedures. Huh. My pen seems to have died on me. Um, tooth brushing. Uh, and trauma to the mouth. Um, it could get in if you have, like, a wound where it, like, you know, let's say you get a cut somewhere and you kind of you stick it in your mouth and suck on it, then it could get in that way. Um, but your teeth are living tissue. They're a part of you. They have blood flowing through them. And if, you know, a dentist is drilling on you or doing some sort of surgery, that creates an open wound that lots of bacteria can get in. And tooth brushing, interestingly, um... There's been studies that have shown that heart health and dental health are correlated. One of the reasons for this is that um, these bacteria, let's say you don't brush your teeth very often. Well, the bacteria build up in your, bot in your mouth. And then when you do brush your teeth or when you get some sort of a um, sore in there, uh, a lot of bacteria gets in. If you brush your teeth on a regular basis, then that bacteria doesn't really build up to those high levels. But anytime you brush your teeth, you know, you are basically having stiff bristles brush against your gums, which are very, very highly vascularized. And that forces some bacteria from your mouth 
into your blood. And if you monitor the bacteria in somebody's blood, which we can do, um, right after they brush their teeth, they have a minor bacteremic incident. You know, you just have a, some bacteria that gets into your blood. And usually your immune system just like kills the stuff off really fast. Uh, but sometimes it can find purchase. Okay, so how does it find purchase? Well, um, this is endocarditis, so it is going to be infecting your heart. And so uh, let's say, let me draw your heart here. Well, a very bad kind of version of your heart. So like you got your valves here and your valves here, All right? And so like blood comes in the right side of your heart, gets pumped into your ventricles, gets pumped out to your lungs, comes back in to your left atrium, and then gets pumped into your left ventricle, and then gets pumped out through your aorta, and then up other places. Um, basically, your heart is always being sprayed with high-pressure water. It makes it very, very difficult for anything to, like, land on the surface there and stay there for any length of time. It's just always getting power jetted away. But there is a place that is relatively protected. I'm going to use green for the bacteria here. That is right under here, underneath the valves. Because when blood is getting sprayed in, that is going to be protected by the open valve. It's in the lee of the stone so to speak. So, uh, if one of these bacteria, uh, viridians or um, uh, epidermidis, lands in this area, it can start growing as a biofilm. Once it starts growing as a biofilm, it's very difficult for your immune system to get rid of it. Uh, now, it can't just land anywhere. Most of healthy blood vessels are, are pretty repellent to bacteria. If it has, it needs a purchase. It needs a, a, a place, like a roughened spot for it to grab hold of, which are commonly deformed heart valves, uh, as well as artificial heart valves and damaged heart valves. Any of those can kind of prepare the surface for it to grab hold and start growing as a biofilm. Um, once it starts growing, like, you know, it's probably going to attract some blood clots, some cholesterol, plaque formation, things like that. Um, but there's basically like two things that can happen. It can just keep growing. And when it does, it's going to do more and more and more damage to the valves and invade into the tissue, but potentially producing abscesses, which are going to further weaken the heart. Um, and uh, you will eventually need new heart valves because they're just going to get worse and worse and worse. And this is what leads to the increasing fatigue. You know, over time, they're doing increasing damage to the blood vessels. The blood vessels become, or the heart valves, the heart valves become inflamed and less functional, um, which means the heart pumps less efficiently. And when the heart pumps less efficiently, you're not going to get oxygen everywhere it needs to go in the body, hence increasing fatigue, all right? And over time, it's doing chronic damage to the valves. Like, those valves will eventually fail, and you will need to have them replaced or 
suffer from heart failure. Uh, but that's kind of a long-term concern. What else is happening? Well, this clutch of bacteria is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually a clump of bacteria and usually, um, you know, some clotting proteins and, you know, blood cells and stuff, a whole mess of junk, but mostly bacteria will break free and then go, Too. get pumped out of the heart where it could go anywhere in the body. In most places where it would land in the body, it's going to be relatively benign. But it can also zip up into the brain, where it can lodge in a uh, in an, an artery or an arterial in the brain, causing aneurysm, causing the blood vessel to burst, or causing infarction, causing the blood vessel to be blocked. And both of those mean stroke. And stroke is bad. You know, these strokes can be fatal and they can keep happening, right? You maybe survive the first one just fine. Well, that infection is still there. It's still growing. It's still gonna produce um, more bacterial growths that could break off and could go cause another stroke. Um, so epidemiology, most cases of subacute bacterial endocarditis are caused by staph epidermidis. Um, viridians tends to cause a slightly more severe infection, um, more likely to cause stroke is my understanding, um, but it's less common, uh, particularly because now that we understand the linkage with dental work, um, if you get dental work done, your dentist will typically ask you whether or not you have a heart murmur, which is a sign of a weakened heart valve. Um, and if you do, they will probably prescribe you prophylactic antibiotics um, so that any bacteria that do get into your bloodstream through the procedure will just be killed off before they can land on anything. Um, in fact, a lot of dentists will just give you the antibiotics and not even bother asking you or finding out whether or not you have a heart murmur. And that probably contributes to the problem that we have with antibiotic overuse and resistant organisms. Um, but given our litigious society, it's kind of understandable that they do this. Um, more cases of the disease are caused by staph epidermidis. Um, this is particularly found in uh, injected drug users, both recreational and medicinal. Um, patients with an intravenous catheter, uh, the artificial surfaces, the plastic in the tubes of the, the, the IV catheter are basically perfect areas for bacteria to start growing as biofilms, and people with artificial heart valves. Um, there was an epidemic associated with black tar heroin users, I think. No, I'm thinking of necrotizing fasciitis for that. Never mind. Um, but it is commonly found in injected drug users, and it just happens that people who are stabbing needles into themselves almost never think, oh, hey, I should, you know, antiseptize this with some alcohol first. Um, and admittedly, if you're trying to get your heroin fixed, then, uh, that's probably not the first thing on your mind, but, like, my wife's diabetic, and she used to be on insulin all the time, and I'm a microbiologist. Like, I definitely stressed the importance of, you know, giving a good alcohol rub to the area before injecting. How often do you think she did that? She did it, like, once when I insisted. And other than that, just never. Just people don't. So, this. Uh, as for prevention and treatment, 
Um, and there's no real prevention other than what I've talked about. Um, prophylactic antibiotics with uh, dental procedures, you know, antiseptic use with um, anytime you're injecting anything in. Other than that, like, the bacteria are already on you and in you. You're not getting rid of them. They're just, they're a part of everyone's natural flora. Treatment can get a little dicey. Um, eh, well, not really dicey. It's just annoying. Um, the, so first off, you have to use uh, bactericidal medications. Because remember, bacteriostatic medications depend upon your immune system to kind of clean up the infection. And your immune system does not do very well at cleaning up uh, biofilms. And biofilms themselves are antibiotic resistant. So, like, well, a normal course of treatment with antibiotics might be like a week or something with a Z pack. Um, treatment of bacterial endocarditis uh, typically is going to be months long with multiple antibiotics. Typically penicillin and gentamicin. Again, because it's growing as a biofilm. Alright, gram negative septicemia. Um, symptoms. Violent shaking, chills, and fever. The fever is typically very high and fairly sudden onset. Um, the violent shaking, the violent shaking can re resemble like almost a seizure, almost convulsions, although they're not. Um, often accompanied by anxiety and rapid breathing. Rapid breathing is because you're going into shock. So you're trying to get oxygen to your body. Um, and anxiety um, is, can be caused by the rapid heart rate, also caused by the fact that you're sort of dying. Um, this symptom of septicemia can progress to septic shock. With shock, urine output drops to basically zero. Respiration and pulse become very fast and very thready. Uh, arms and legs become cool and dusky. Uh, this is accompanied by rising fever, um, multiple organ failure, and potentially death. Causative agent. It's a gram-negative septicemia. It can theoretically be caused by any gram-negative. Basically, the cause is endotoxins. Um, shock is common despite treatment. This is a disease where you can successfully treat the bacteria and still lose the patient because, as we've talked about before, treating the bacteria with, say, an antibiotic can release a big bolus of endotoxins that can cause the body to go into shock. And if you have a patient with gram-negative septicemia, the mortality rate is about 50%. Um, the most common organisms are E. coli, uh, which is a common intestinal bacteria. It's also the most common organism to cause UTIs and getting in through the urinary tract to the bladder, to the ureter, to the kidney, and then from the kidney into the blood is a common way for gram negatives to get in. Uh, Pseudomonas arginosa, which is a common um, soil and environmental bacteria, and it's uh, fairly common in hospital settings and can get in through wound contamination. And bacterioides which is a part of your normal intestinal and upper respiratory flora. Um, uh, 
one reason why, say, like gut wounds, and somebody stabs you or shoots you in the gut, those are frequently fatal because basically they introduce your gut bacteria into your blood. Um, and that will almost always produce a gram-negative blood infection, which, not awesome. So the pathogenesis. Generally, the infection starts outside of the bloodstream. Um, although in cases of injury, it might be introduced directly in. Um, for whatever reason, you have endotoxins released. Uh, antibiotics can enhance that. Macrophages respond by trying to basically localize and wall off the area. Um, if they fail to do that, the endotoxin gets into the bloodstream. Uh, and this causes a cascade of harmful events, leading to um, basically uh, a super antigen-like set of symptoms, um, massive release of um, pyrogens, leading to high fever, um, massive inflammation throughout the whole body, causing... Uh, shock, drop in blood pressure, multiple organ failure. The lungs are partic particularly susceptible to this. Uh, when they become inflamed, fluid leaks from the capillaries in the lungs into the tissue, causing pneumonia. Um, the capillaries themselves can be destroyed by this. Uh, and once the capillaries in your lungs are destroyed, it's pretty much downhill from there. Epidemiology, so um, gram-negative septicemia is typically a nosocomial disease. Um, it can also come from urinary tract infections, which may be nosocomial or may not, um, progressing to kidney infections. Uh, it can be introduced into a wound. It can be caused by injury, but most cases are hospital-acquired. Um, Often you get brought into the hospital for, you know, kidney failure, liver failure, you know, a decubitus ulcer, a um, whole set of other possibilities for a whole bunch of things. Um, and what kills you is the gram-negative septicemia, which happens as a secondary infection. Um, Incidents are very highly correlated with age and health. So um, longer lifespans, increasing hospital stays, antibiotic suppression of normal flora, so the more often you're in, on antibiotics, all of these things increase the likelihood that you will get gram-negative septicemia. Um, immunosuppressive drugs, uh, steroids or things like that, which many particularly older patients are on, um, can lead to higher incidence of gram-negative septicemia, and uh, medical devices like urinary and IV catheters provide great areas for biofilms to start forming. And uh, many gram-negative organisms can uh, grow as biofilms. And once they do, they are very difficult for your immune system to deal with and for antibiotics to deal with. Prevention. Um, prevention of gram-negative septicemia largely relies on identifying the infection while it's still localized before it goes septic and treating it there. Uh, also good... Um, good... Good medical technique, not contaminating wounds, things like that. Um, if you are treating a case of septicemia, uh, the treatment of the infection is going to depend on the type of organism, but will usually involve some sort of antibiotics. Um, and then you just have to plan on dealing with the shock because, I mean, you've got to treat the organism. It's not going away on its own. 
Uh, but that will release endotoxins, and those endotoxins will cause problems. They might not go so far as causing shock, but they will cause problems. And you just got to be ready on tap to, to deal with those problems when they inevitably happen. All right. Uh, infectious mononucleosis, sometimes called mono or kissing disease. I'm just checking to make sure that it's still recording. Um, signs and symptoms. So it has a relatively long incubation period of 30 to 60 days. Uh, this makes it very difficult to contact trace, right? Um, you know, if somebody comes down with it, it, it's really, really hard to find out, okay, what were they at? two months ago where they may have gotten it. Probably a whole bunch of things. The symptoms are um, fever, uh, sore throat, um, often accompanied by uh, cough and some upper respiratory symptoms. Um, the throat can be covered in pus. Marked fatigue. And by this I mean like severe fatigue. Not like, oh God, I'm so tired type fatigue. Like can't get out of bed fatigue. Uh, enlargement of the spleen and lymph nodes, particularly the cervical lymph nodes around the throat, sometimes the axillary lymph nodes underneath the arm. Generally speaking, the fever and throat symptoms persist for about two weeks. The other symptoms can last about three. The causative agent is Epstein-Barr virus, a double-stranded envelope DNA virus that is related to herpes viruses. It's in the herpes virus family, and like most other herpes viruses, it um, produces latent infections uh, that can reactivate and that you continue to have for potentially the rest of your life. Um, although reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus is a somewhat Mysterious phenomenon. So the pathogenesis. Um, the, back, the, the virus is born by um, viruses primarily in the saliva. Uh, and it infects the mucous membranes of your mouth and throat, um, where it replicates and is carried to your lymph nodes. Inside your lymph nodes, it infects B lymphocytes, uh, where it can infect productively or non-productively, um, and will usually do both in different cells at different times. In a productive infection, this is actually relatively similar to, say, the, um, the, the lytic cycle in bacteriophages, the rep virus just replicates, kills the B cell, boom, spreads. In non-productive, it goes latent as a provirus and causes the cell to replicate over and over and over again because every time the cell replicates, it's also making a copy of the virus. It can also cause the B cells to activate and produce immunoglobulins when they should not be doing so. Um, so this is what causes the swelling of the lymph nodes is these B cells replicating out of control. Uh, that causes lymph node enlargement, spleen enlargement. Occasionally the spleen ruptures and if it does so, then it is likely to be fatal unless you are unless it's caught very fast and you're like already in the hospital where they can patch that up. Um, the spleen is very highly vascularized. If it blows up, it, you, know, you bleed to death very quickly. Um, as your B cells are infected by viruses and replicating out of control, um, your T cells respond through the cell mediated response and start attacking and destroying them. Uh, the B cells look um, odd. As you can see here, this is an abnormal B cell. This is a more normal looking B cell next to it. Um, 
hence the mononucleosis. So it can be diagnosed on the basis of a blood smear examined by, um, under a microscope. So, reactivation. Generally speaking, after a couple of months, your immune system will progress to the point where any cells that are actively producing Epstein-Barr virus will get suppressed very quickly, and it will have a hard time spreading. But it remains present in your blood for essentially the rest of your life. And like, say, uh, chicken pox or herpes, it can reactivate. Now, what exactly it does when it reactivates is a object of some debate. Um, some people believe that it's related to chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, but, on the other hand, there isn't a lot of evidence for that. Uh, and chronic fatigue syndrome has been linked to, like, hundreds of things. And nobody even knows if chronic fatigue syndrome is even real. So, that's as it may be. Um, in, uh, in addition, well, what does the virus do when it reactivates? It causes B cells to replicate out of control. We have a term for cells replicating out of control. And um, so the Epstein-Barr virus is present genetically in nearly all cases of Burkitt's lymphoma and nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Uh, and Burkitt's lymphoma is, of course, a disease that involves lymphatic cells replicating out of control. Now, most people who have Epstein-Barr, which is honestly most people, don't have Burkitt's lymphoma. So clearly it doesn't just reactivate and cause cancer. But it appears that that plus a whole bunch of other things going wrong at the same time might cause cancer, or at least this specific type of cancer. Um, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. On the other hand, the evidence is a little bit not perfect because um, Epstein-Barr virus being present in all cases of Burkitt's lymphoma, well, to be honest, Epstein-Barr virus is present in almost all humans because almost everyone gets infected by age 40. So, you know, Epstein-Barr virus might also be, uh, you know, present in all cases of everything else if we went and looked for it. So we're not entirely sure. Um, epidemiologically, Epstein-Barr virus is distributed across the world. It's one of the most common viruses out there. Um, it particularly spreads in crowded conditions with poor hygiene, particularly among the, um, the, the impoverished. Uh, and most people get, in fact, most people living in crowded conditions with poor hygiene get infected while they are young. And people who are, who get infected while they are young are much more likely to have asymptomatic infections. Um, so if you like grow up in the inner city or something like that, you almost certainly got it and you probably didn't notice it. Uh, because you probably got it when you're like five, had no symptoms, whatever. Uh, now, People who are raised in somewhat more sterile environments 
say, affluent people in the suburbs uh, don't tend to get it when they're kids. Now, suddenly they go off to college or to the military or some sort of situation where they're suddenly put into very close quarters with a lot of very similar people. Like suddenly you've got, you know, tens of thousands of freshmen crowded into the dorms coming from the suburbs or something like that. Uh, they're not being very careful. They're swapping sw spit all over the place. And... Um, it, it, mono spreads like wildfire under those conditions. It's a very common college disease. Um, and if you're older when you get it, like a, a late teenager, early adult, it's much more likely to be symptomatic and uh, more serious. In addition, Epstein-Barr virus can persist in the saliva for 18 months after you're infected. So, you know, you get it, you get better. Okay, you can still infect people for a year and a half. Not only that, but it's a latent infection. It can reactivate 10, 20, 30 years later um, for short periods, and you can shed virus again. It's probably an asymptomatic reactivation. You won't even notice that it happened, uh, but... It, you can still pass it on. Uh, as far as transfer, it's basically salivary contact. Uh, and it requires a reasonable amount of saliva. So we're talking kissing, as you might guess from the name. Um, also uh, sharing drinks. Uh, with someone, very common way to transfer it as well. Uh, it's not so commonly transferred like droplet, not super common. Um, but basically, anytime you got saliva being shared between two people, you can get uh, mono transferring. Uh, as I mentioned before, by middle age, most people have antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus, meaning that they've been infected at some point in their lives. Much like herpes, it's like, it happens. It happens to almost everyone. Most of us don't notice it happening, and it doesn't impact most of our lives. Uh, treatment and prevention. Generally speaking, the treatment is to just let it run its course. So palliative care, observation. Um, in severe cases, there are a whole class of anti-herpes drugs, particularly uh, acyclovir and famcyclovir. And since this is a herpes family drug, it will um, help in those cases. Uh, corticosteroids, so immunosuppressants, uh, are sometimes used if the disease is severe enough that it like swells the throat shut and you're having trouble breathing or swallowing uh, to relieve the, uh, the inflammation there. But for the most part, um, unless you've got one of those severe cases, you just stay in bed and try not to spread it around. Uh, in terms of prevention, don't swap spit with people, right? So avoid this life of others. Don't kiss people randomly or who are going around kissing a lot of other people. Um, don't share toothbrushes or drinking glasses with people. Uh, there is no vaccine. Hemorrhagic fevers. Uh, these are considered to be emerging diseases, meaning they are relatively new, or at least relatively newly discovered. Um, and the main ones are Ebola and Marburg. Uh, signs and symptoms. High fever, usually sudden onset. 
uh, headache, abdominal pain, joint and muscle pain, sore throat, macular rash, which is uh, in the eyes, uh, and bleeding, often from, uh, say, the gums, the inner lining of the mouth, the lungs, the urinary system, the digestive system. Basically, blood leaks out of all of your orifices. Then you will often develop um, basically uh, hemorrhages underneath your skin, um, similar to what's sometimes called petechiae. Uh, basically, your capillaries burst, releasing blood all over under your skin. Uh, both Marburg and Ebola have very high case fatality rates, uh, anywhere from 20 to 90 percent. Death is usually by multiple organ failure um, and shock, as you basically your internal organs start to liquefy and you just bleed out inside. Causative agents are um, the Ebola virus and the Marburg virus both of which are endemic to um, sort of central sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we don't know what the reservoir is, but um, we do know that people got infected from green monkeys when it was first identified. So the pathogenesis um, it starts by infecting mononuclear phagocytic cells. So that would be monocytes, dendritic cells, macrophages, um, and spreads throughout the body that way. Uh, prevention is, um, I mean, don't come into contact with people who have it. We don't know what the natural reservoir is. We know it must have one other than humans, because there are times when there are no humans who have Ebola and it just comes back again. Um, so we think that it might be fruit bats that carry the virus naturally, but we're not sure. Um, treatments. So patients are usually kept um, hydrated, O2 levels maintained, oxygen levels maintained, so they're going to need oxygen support because their blood is hemorrhaging all over the place. Um, their blood no longer clots is a big problem, so they basically become a... Uh, 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 oh, what's the term for that? They become bleeders, right? And that's what causes the hemorrhages to cause them to bleed out and die. So we give them plasma containing coagulation factors to restore their clotting function. Um, fast diagnosis, fast response uh, are both necessary to prevent epidemics. Uh, honestly, a lot of the prevention focuses on stopping people from spreading it rather than like curing it because we don't have any very good curatives. Uh, a lot of transmission to healthcare workers has been noticed. It transfers through contact with blood. Most things that transfer through contact with blood are very hard to pass on uh, because you don't come in contact with people's blood that often. But in this case, they're basically dissolving into huge piles of blood. Like they start bleeding out of everywhere so if you're caring for them, you're going to come in contact with their blood. It's very important that healthcare workers have very, very rigorous protective gear, PPE, and infection control measures. Um, vaccines uh, are under development. I actually think that um, in the 2015 Ebola epidemic, a vaccine was deployed Uh it had not yet been approved, but it was deployed under compassionate use standards under the assumption that, like, hey, it's going to be better than getting Ebola, right? Um, 
And it was supposed to have had fairly good results. I believe it was the first deployment of one of these new RNA viruses that the new uh, COVID vaccines, or RNA vaccines, uh, that the new COVID vaccines are in the same family X. Um, COVID and Ebola are not related at all. It's just similar vaccine technologies. Uh, and I don't know if that vaccine has been approved for commercial use yet, or if it's still considered experimental. But um, uh, it has been deployed, and it did seem to work okay. 